Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm delighted and honored to have Dr. Matthew Greenhot from the University of Michigan and attorney Laurel Francoeur here with us today to talk about flying with a food allergy and the legal that will cover both the legal and medical issues that we as parents really need to know. This webinar is offered by Kids with Food Allergies as part of its education outreach program. I'm Linda Mitchell, Vice President of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. I run the Kids with Food Allergies Division of AFA, and I have the privilege of being your moderator again today. The presenters for all of our webinars are doing so as volunteers without compensation. On behalf of KFA, I'm very grateful for Dr. Matt and Laurel to donate their time to be here with us. I have a few housekeeping details to run through while we do a few polls. First of all, today's webinar is made possible through a sponsorship from Mylan Specialty. We rely on donors and corporate partners like Mylan for the financial support that enables us to develop education programs for families. Next, please remember that this webinar is of a general nature only and is not medical or legal advice. You should consult your own physician for any medical advice you seek with regard to food allergies and other medical conditions. And we don't imply that any food ingredients, products, restaurants, etc. mentioned today are safe for you and your family. You need to consult with your own physician and with regard to foods, of course, to always remember to read those labels. Today's webinar is being recorded. We also have a large audience here with us. And for this reason, everyone's in listen-only mode. Um, we will run a few quick polls like you're seeing in front of you right now, and you're also welcome to type in questions in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel that you all have. And later in today's webinar, we'll stop to give away some gifts from our corporate supporters, Allergic Traveler, Sun Butter, and Dr. Lucy. The recipients of these gifts will be picked randomly from those still in attendance later on in the session. And when we end the webinar, you will see a survey, and we appreciate your sharing your impressions with us as we use your feedback to help improve the future direction of our webinar series. So now, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's presenters. Matthew Greenhot, MD, MBA, M MSc, um, is a board-certified pediatrician and specialist in allergy and immunology. He currently serves as an assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Michigan and is research director for the University of Michigan Food Allergy Center. Dr. Greenhot is also the co-director of the University of Michigan Combined Pediatric Eosinophilic Esophagitis Clinic. He's a graduate of Tufts University where he earned both his medical degree and his Master of Business Administration degree and he completed his fellowship in allergy and immunology at the University of Michigan in 2008. He also received a Master of Science in Health and Healthcare Policy at the U of M Rackham School of Graduate Studies in 2012. Dr. Greenhot is a health services researcher with more than 40 peer-reviewed publications, and he has an eye towards using his work to influence food allergy-related healthcare policy. He is a national expert on um, a number of things, including airline travel with peanut allergy. He's a member of and active in both the Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. He's associate editor for the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and is re he receives research funding from the National Institutes of Health, the college, and private foundations. Laurel Francoeur graduated from Massachusetts Institute of Technology with a Bachelor of Science degree in Political Science and a minor in Philosophy. She is also a graduate of Suffolk Law School and has been a practicing lawyer since 1996. She is a spokesperson for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America and is also the Education Project Manager for Kids with Food Allergies, a division of AFA. She is a support group leader for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America New England chapter and has served on its board of directors. She was on the Food Allergy Initiative Steering Committee, and she has appeared on numerous TV and radio media um, opportunities talking about anaphylaxis and epinephrine advocacy issues. Laurel has drafted legislation in Massachusetts, which now gives students easier access to life-saving medication, and she has also testified at the state and federal levels about food allergy issues. Laurel is the author of two books. How to Advocate for Your Food Allergic Child, A Manual for Getting What Your Child Needs at School, and Flying with Food Allergies, What You Need to Know. She is also co-founder of Green Laurel Documents, an online resource for food allergy tools, including automated health care plans and restaurant cards. 
So uh, thanks, Dr. Matt and Laurel, for joining us here today. I'd like to hand over the floor to you so that you can go over the polls and um, get started on your presentations. Thank you, Linda. So this is Laurel Francoeur, and I'm looking here at the poll results. And the overwhelming majority of people listening today are parents at 88% with 2% of patients. The next question, have you flown while managing your own or a loved one's food allergies? 60% yes and 40% no. And lastly, how many epinephrine auto-injectors have you taken on a commercial plane with you? And the majority in this survey have taken three or more, um, with 6% actually taking none. So thank you for those poll results. And we will begin with the talk. So as you are probably aware, um, at any given time, they estimate there are approximately 20,000 planes in the air worldwide. And when it comes to talking about allergies on planes, peanuts seem to be the main focus. I was wondering why this was true, and um, I came up with a couple reasons. First, Americans seem to associate flying with peanuts. We're all used to getting the package of peanuts on the plane and sort of just synonymous to many people with flying. Um, but there's also another, another instance called peanut fares. What this was in the 1970s, there was a struggling airline called Texas International Airlines, and they lobbied to get um, help from the government with fares for their flights, and they were offering these what they called really cheap flights, and they called them peanut fares. And at the same time, they were competing with Southwest, and um, they both decided then that peanuts were a cheap snack to offer on planes, and also something that would tie in with their cheap fares, the peanut fares, as they called them. Next, peanut allergy is on the rise. Um, I'll let Dr. Greenhot talk a little bit more about that and question what the statistics are and how that uh, plays out. And lastly, we'll talk a little later about the Department of Transportation and how it has taken a specific interest in peanuts on flying. But as we all know, any food allergy is of concern to the flyer, not just peanuts. Unfortunately, peanuts seem to get the majority of the attention of the public. Next slide. This is a picture taken with a GPS system. This is a snapshot of 3 p.m. on a certain day, I believe it was in the summer, of the east coast of the United States. And what it illustrates is all of the planes that were in the air at that particular moment in time. Again, it's only the eastern half of the United States, but you can see from this graphic that there are a lot of planes flying at any given time. So I want people to realize that planes are flying all the time, and we're not always hearing about reactions. So there is some comfort in knowing that the numbers are in our favor, that there are many planes flying all the time, and relatively few incidents that are associated with flying. So the next slide. So what are your rights? Well, unfortunately, we're going to find out that it's not all that much, um, but there are some things you need to know. So the next slide, please. The first thing you need to know when you're flying is the contract of carriage. This is an agreement that you are automatically entering into any time you buy an airline ticket. You may not know it, but you are. In the old days when they had paper tickets, it, the contract of carriage would be printed in very fine print on several pages attached right to the ticket. Nowadays, with e-tickets, you don't have the, the printed tickets, but you do have them on their website. So every airline has to have its contract of carriage on its website. So it's an important place to start when you're looking for what kinds of things you can expect from the airline. Unfortunately, courts have held that these are a binding contract. So if in the contract of carriage it says you're waiving your rights to sue or do certain things, the courts have held you're bound by that even if you didn't read them. And the courts have said just the, the fact that you had a chance to read them and that you had notice of them through um, notice on the website that you can click the link and read it, 
just as long as you had noticed that there was such a thing, you are bound by it, even if you haven't read it. So um, that's a good place to start when you're thinking, okay, what kinds of policies does the airline have, and what kinds of things are they going to offer me? Um, they can be several pages long. They can cover a wide variety of topics, not just legal topics and your right to sue. For instance, the other day I looked up the contract of carriage for um, an airline, and one of the things that you are agreeing to if you fly on this particular airline is that you will be clothed in a manner that would cause discomfort, that would not cause discomfort or offense to other passengers. So basically what that airline is saying is that if you are wearing something that they find offensive, they can refuse you uh, access to the airline. Uh, again, people don't even realize that these exist, but the courts have held that they are binding. So it's a good place to start on the website. Uh, next page. So disability law. The law that applies to airlines is different. They have their own unique regulations. And it's heavily regulated, as we know, by the federal government. The early law, back when airlines first started uh, appearing and flying, there was very little protection for the consumer. So in 1958, the first law was the Federal Aviation Act that was passed. This was intended to help, uh, basically what they say, to ensure safe and adequate service on airlines. What that meant, or how that was interpreted by the government, was that um, basically competition affairs, that fares would be reasonable, that you wouldn't have unlawful practice when it came to fares. They really weren't addressing disabilities or patients with issues at that time. The, the law really didn't cover the scope of that. So what happened then was the, the a group representing um, the paralyzed veterans brought a case saying that uh, disabled veterans should have certain rights um, due to their disability on the airline. And they brought that case under Section 504. Now, this is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which a lot of parents probably are familiar with in the context of education. It's what, at the school, we call a 504 plan. It's basically saying that any organization that gets federal funding has to comply with certain rules and regulations and make accommodations for uh, people with disabilities. Well, the paralyzed veterans case, they said, no, the airlines are not getting federal funding and therefore Section 504 does not apply to the airlines. Very recently, there was another case called the Schatz case. And this was fairly interesting. The people brought the case and they said, because the airlines got a bailout after 9-11, that that bailout should constitute federal funding and thus qualify the airlines for Section 504. The court Laurel? disagreed, and the Schatz case said that the 9-11 bailout was compensation. It was not a government subsidy, and therefore 504 still doesn't apply. The Laurel, can I stop you for just a minute? Um, sure. Melanie needs to refresh the screen because some people are not seeing the slides. Oh, OK. OK. I think we're OK now. I hope everybody who can't see the slides can see them now. I apologize for that. Um, if you can't see the slides, will you let us know again by adding a comment in the questions pane? Thank you. OK, so we just said that Section 504 doesn't apply to the airline. It does, however, apply to the airport. So that's actually the facility you know, where you go to board the plane. And that's because the airports are usually federally funded. So you're entitled to have certain accommodations like wheelchair ramps and so forth at the airport, but not once you get on the airline. Now, another major case that people with food allergies know about is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Unfortunately, the courts have held it does not apply to airlines. They have found a way to say, basically, the ADA does not apply to airlines. So it's very important for people to realize when they're talking about their rights, Section 504 does not apply on the plane, and neither does the ADA. So if we could switch to the next slide, please. So what happened was Congress realized that people with disabilities did need to be accommodated on airlines. 
So they passed in 1986 the Air Carrier Access Act. And what this does is it covers all domestic and most international flights. There are some restrictions on international flights with flights that just sort of touch down in the United States but don't actually uh, have business in the United States. But it's kind of a technical uh, difference, and we're not going to talk about that here. But just realize that it covers all domestic and most international flights. And under this, individuals who have, a, who have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities are considered disabled. This is the same definition that the ADA and the 504 uses. However, it's a different act. It's the Air Carrier Access Act. Congress gave the Department of Transportation the authority to make regulations to enforce the ACA, ACAA. And these are called Part 382 because that's the part of the federal regulations um, that they fall under. So when you're wondering what your rights are as a food allergic parent, you need to start thinking about or ask about Part 382. And if you go to the airline, um, they are required to have a copy of all of these regulations with them so that if you request them, you are entitled to get a copy of those regulations. Next page, please. So. The regulations to the ACAA are relatively long, but here I've picked out the ones that are appropriate for people flying with allergies. First of all, if they have to make any accommodations for you, they're not allowed to charge you for them. So they cannot say, we're charging you an extra fee because we have to do something because of your disability. Epinephrine is allowed on the plane, and there is a medical kit on board that does have epinephrine. We'll talk a little later about that. Um, but flight attendants can't access that unless there's a doctor on board or they have contacted a doctor on the ground. And I'll go into more detail about that later. Security in epinephrine. If you have a disability, you're, you're not allowed to be subjected to more security than the average passenger. And as far as bringing your epinephrine on the plane, as long as you have the original prescription label, so that's the label that the pharmacy gave you when you got your epinephrine. It'll be allowed. Sometimes they don't even bother to check that. But that's all you need. The next thing that's very important, medical certificates, they're not necessary for food allergies. The regulations specifically say that you do not need a medical certificate. All you need is to have that prescription label. Next slide. Oh, one, one more point before I get into the next slide is that um, whether allergies are considered a disability under the Air Carrier Access Act, there have been no federal cases that discuss it. So we don't know under case law what the issue is. However, the Department of Transportation does recognize food allergies as a disability under the ACAA. And we'll talk a little more about that. But just to let you know that there's no specific case law about it, but the DOT does consider it to be a disability. So this is just a brief slide about eating airline food, and it's not a good idea for people with allergens. Um, a lot of times there are hidden allergens in the food. Um, meals are prepared one year in advance, meaning the menus, not the actual meals themselves. But the menus are prepared one year in advance in most of the, the places that cater to airlines. So it's hard to get the menus to change or to make, have, let them make last minute changes to the menu. There was an uh, investigation done by, by um, ABC's 2020, and they investigated some of the places that prepared the airline foods. And they found more than 1,500 violations in a four year period. They found ants, roaches, flies in the uh, facilities where the food was being prepared. Um, some people flying, I believe it was, I can't remember, I believe it was Delta, but I'm not sure, um, found needles in turkey sandwiches. There were four reports of needles found in turkey sandwiches. And in a Qantas airline, um, a woman found maggots in her trail mix. So um, even if you don't have food allergies, it's not always a great thing to eat the airline food anyway. There was also a um, relatively small study where they checked the tray tables um, on airlines. And they actually found in 60% of the cases, MRSA was present on the tray tables. It was a small study, but again, it just shows you that um, you need to be concerned about cleanliness and 
where you're where you're sitting and what might be sitting on the chair with you. Uh, next. So people have asked, well, what is the best airline or what what's the policy of different airlines? Um, the Department of Transportation um, is tracking um, what they consider the large U.S. airlines in their serving of nuts. So this website here gives you um, quick access to the uh, nut policies for the major U.S. carriers. So that is again another pl a good place to start when you're wondering what does the airline do in terms of nuts. Next slide. So what are your remedies? Next slide. Well, if you feel you have been discriminated against because an airline has not accommodated your food allergies, there's very little you can do, unfortunately. You can file a complaint with what are called the complaint resolution officers. These are people that have to be present at every airline. So you're, uh, you have to go to, uh, every, to the airline and every airport. And you can ask to talk to this, what they call the CRO, the complaint resolution officer. And it's their job to make sure that passengers with food or with disabilities are accommodated. And again, they're sort of the point person between you and the airline. Um, you can also file a complaint by mail. If you file a complaint by mail, the airline has to respond to you in writing. Your next remedy is you can file a complaint with the Department of Transportation. The Department of Transportation keeps track of all of the complaints that it receives regarding the Air Carrier Access Act and uh, tallies them up and prints an annual report for each airline showing what violations of the ACA that they have uh, had happened. Um, the problem is that um, the DOT has to be the one to go after the airline if there's a problem with the accommodations. So, and they have very limited uh, resources and limited things that they can do. The big thing that the Department of Transportation can do is fine an airline. And um, what they will do is they go through and if they see something that is particularly egregious, that's very bad, or if they find a pattern of discrimination, for instance, an airline continues to do the same thing over and over again, then they will issue a fine. Um, Looking back the past few years, the DOT has taken action about 30 times a year. Um, and most of those actions that they've taken against airlines have been related to uh, deceptive fare and pricing cases. They take very few uh, cases where they fine for uh, disability cases, again, unless they can show it's very egregious. And with that fine, you as the passenger don't get the money the government gets the money. Um, also, airlines have the ability to offset those fines, too, with other measures. So um, a typical violation is usually about $20,000, but the airline can even find a way to get around that. So um, there really isn't that much teeth behind what the DOT does. The most important thing to remember is that you cannot file a lawsuit against the, law, the airline for failing to make accommodations. People don't realize this. They think under ADA or 504 they have a right to sue the airline. They don't. Under the ACAA, which we talked about the airline, the uh, Air Carriers uh, Access Act, courts have found over and over again that you have no right to sue an airline based on that. So you, if, for instance, you ask for a certain accommodation, like um, you want your wheelchair to be on the plane, for instance, and they don't put the wheelchair on the plane, you cannot sue the airline for not doing that. Your only recourse is to file a complaint. You can sue, sue the airline for other things, like negligence. Um, so if they've done something that's wrong, um, or other torts, uh, if they've caused you emotional harm or some other form of harm, um, you can sue. Um, but again, those are also limited by that contract of carriage that we talked about earlier. So just by your buying the ticket, you may be limiting what kinds of lawsuits you can bring against the airline. And again, 
it's very difficult to file a lawsuit under the ACAA. Courts time and time again have said that only DOT can sue the airlines, not individual people. Next slide. So this is an example of the data that the DOT collects every year. And I just picked this one at random for no particular reason, but this is um, from 2012, American Airlines. And you can see they list the reasons that people file the complaint and the disabilities that they filed the complaint about, and they tally those numbers. So for this year under allergies, which is the fourth column from the right, American Airlines had 40 complaints of uh, problems with allergies. Now again, these are compiled by the DOT. They do not take action on these complaints unless something is particularly egregious or they see a pattern of behavior. So unfortunately, you file the complaint and it kind of gets tracked and then put aside, which is unfortunate. Um, you know, I would still say to file, if you have an issue on a plane, to file with the DOT because it's important that, that it gets recognized and gets tallied in this so that other par parents or people who are looking at an airline's history can see which ones have the most complaints against them. But unfortunately, I wish I could say that every complaint is addressed, and unfortunately it's not. Uh, next slide, please. So the Department of Transportation, so how is this relevant? Well, they are the ones who uh, make the regulations regarding disabilities, and they are the ones who enforce the, the um, regulations regarding disabilities. So basically what happened was in 1998, the DOT issued a letter to the airline carriers and basically said, look, uh, maybe you should do something about food allergies. It's becoming an increasing problem. People are um, getting concerned about it. And the DOT suggested that they implement um, buffer zones. And they said this might be a good idea. And in fact, the DOT went so far as to say that um, a buffer zone would be considered, on their opinion, a reasonable accommodation. Well, what happened was there was extreme backlash from this. and People got upset, um, particularly people involved with the production of peanuts got upset, contacted Congress, and in 2000, Congress issued a law, and it was an Appropriations Act. So that means it was tied to funding for the DOT. And what that act specifically said is no federal funds could be used to require airlines to provide peanut-free buffer zones or to otherwise restrict the distribution of peanuts on airlines until they were shown to Congress a peer-reviewed study showing that peanuts could cause harm. So basically what Congress said to the DOT is you are not allowed to make any regulations regarding buffer zones or otherwise restrict the distribution of peanuts unless you come to Congress with a peer-reviewed study showing that this is really an issue. If you do, you, have, you risk losing your funding. So what happened? The DOT let the issue drop. In 2002, they did issue what they consider an what they call an advisory circular. and It was called Management of Passengers Who May Be Sensitive to Allergens. And they recommended to the airlines some ways of handling allergies, but it had no force. It basically was just sort of, this is what we think the best practices are. Um, but it was very vague. And again, they weren't allowed to actually make any regulations regarding it. What happened in 2010, the DOT realized peanut allergy seems to be on the rise. We seem to have a lot more complaints about allergy. We want to relook at the issue of regulating uh, peanuts on flights. So they put out a public proposal. And what they proposed were three things. One, what if we ban peanuts on all flights? Two, what if we only ban peanuts on flights that contain a peanut allergic passenger? Or three, what if we require airlines to have a buffer zone? And they opened this up to public comment. And 
received an awful lot of comment and from various elements of society and people and organizations and a lot of people all commented for or against um, the proposed regulation. Well, what happened was a congressman sent a letter to the Department of Transportation basically saying, um, do you remember that 2000 Act where we said if you do anything regarding uh, peanuts, we're going to take away your money? Well, that act is still in effect. And um, 24 other senators and congresspeople signed that, uh, that letter, um, again, reminding the DOT there was a lot of lobbying and pushing to remind the DOT of that earlier Appropriations Act. So what happened was the DOT said, OK, uh, we're going to back down. We're not even going to look into this because we don't want to lose our funding. So that's where we are in terms of national regulations about nuts on airlines. The Department of Transportation is the department that would be responsible for making those regulations. And their hands are tied by this 2000 law that says they will lose their funding if they do this. So what happened now is that every airline is free to make whatever policy regarding nuts or allergens that they want to. And every airline has its own policy. We showed you the slide earlier where you could find what those policies are. And there's no restriction on what they can and cannot do, unfortunately. Um, until something happens to this act to allow the DOT to do its thing, we're stuck with, with that. And we're stuck with the airlines being able to uh, come up with their own policies. Next slide. So another question that comes up are how are emergencies handled on a plane? Next slide. So all flight attendants have first aid training. But many people don't know that flight attendants are not required by either the Department of Transportation or the FAA to treat any medical condition. So it's up to the carrier. They can say, we don't want our flight attendants doing any kind of first aid. Um, they have that right. There's no law that mandates that if there is an emergency on the plane that the flight attendant has to respond. Now, they usually will, and of course it usually is the policy to um, respond. But again, it, they don't have to. So there's no right that if you are having a reaction that you are going to get medical attention unfortunately. Um, but again, most airlines are good, and the flight attendants do have the training, and they will step up, and they will help you. They do have a medicine kit on all planes, and in that medicine kit is epinephrine. Uh, I'm not clear whether it's an EpiPen or whether it's um, a vial. My sense is it's a vial of epinephrine, but I'm not sure. Um, but flight attendants are not allowed to use that medical kit unless they're either a doctor on board or if they get authorization from a doctor on the ground. So what airlines have done is they have contracts with certain medical providers that have this radio service where they can call and get a doctor right away on the radio and they can talk to them about the symptoms and they get advice from that doctor about what to do. And if that doctor says, OK, I'm giving you authorization to use the medicine, then they can go ahead and use the medicine. But unless you have a doctor on the board, or unless they get that word from the ground, the flight attendant has no authority to use the epinephrine in the kit. Next slide. So in 1998, this, there was the US Aviation Medical Assistance Act. And basically, this is sort of a good Samaritan provision, basically saying that if the airlines do something to help you. Um, they're not going to be guilty of uh, negligence unless it's egregious. Um, and also, it protects people who volunteer. And what it says is that people who volunteer to help have to be medically qualified. They have to give the care in good faith, and they can't get paid for it. And also, the carrier must have a good faith belief that the passenger is medically qualified. So when the flight attendant says, is there a doctor on board, they have to be relatively certain that it is a doctor who steps up and helps. But once that doctor does step up and help, he or she is protected from liability, from mistakes. So that's good to know. Next slide. 
Now, emergency landings. People wonder, well, if I needed to make an emergency landing, what's the law? Well, the pilot has broad discretion to make an emergency landing, and he really has the ultimate authority. There are certain factors that the pilot considers, though. First, cost. There was a recent study that showed the cost to divert an airline or an airplane to a different airport can range anywhere from three to $100,000. They also have to consider the proximity to the airport and their ability to land safely. So for instance, it sometimes can take about 20 to 30 minutes just to land a plane. Um, they can't come down immediately because of uh, issues of physics and such. And also they have to worry how close they are to an airport, how much fuel do they have. Um, airplanes are not allowed to what's called land heavy unless there's a real um, exception to that. Um, they also get the advice from the medical team on the ground when that, that radio, when the flight attendant is radioing the medical team on the ground. If they say to the pilot, I don't think it's an emergency, then the pilot can take that advice. Um, and lastly is there's an unrealistic fear of discipline. Anytime a pilot deviates from any rule that he's bound by, he has to write a report. And that report automatically gets reviewed. And there is a chance that if the pilot has made an emergency landing when it wasn't called for, he can get fined. He can lose his license. Now, there's been no instance of a pilot who has ever had their license suspended because of this. Or, or, but unfortunately, it's in the back of every pilot's mind that, oh, if I, if I uh, make an emergency landing when it's not warranted, not only am I costing me the airline money, but I, I'm going to get reviewed by uh, the government and I could uh, get disciplined. So those are all the things that a pilot thinks about in his mind when an emergency happens on the plane. Next slide. So this is a recent study that came out in 2013 and it analyzed a little over 744 million airline passengers over a two-year period. And out of that, about, there were about 11,920 total med medical emergencies. Of that, 265 were allergic. Unfortunately, they didn't differentiate between uh, food allergies and environmental allergies. Out of that, only 12 required the aircraft to be diverted. 40 required transport to hospital. Eight were actually admitted to the hospital. And what's reassuring is that there were zero deaths caused by an allergic reaction on a plane. Next slide. Another issue is what foods can you bring as a parent on board? Um, you can bring pretty much anything, but if they're liquids, um, they're bound by that three ounce rule. And here's a list of things that the TSA lists that you cannot bring on board if it's over the 3.4 ounces. Um, you can, however, bring non-prescription medicine up to four ounces. So there's a little flexibility on the three ounce rule when it comes to uh, prescription medicine. Next slide. There's also um, some wiggle room about baby items, formula, breast milk, and juice, uh, baby food. Um, unfortunately, they may be subject to additional screening, but there are some ways you can carry more than 3.4 ounces of that food if you need it for your baby. So because these, these keep changing and it's subject to all kinds of different factors, I have the phone number there. It's called TSA CARES. And that's the number that if you have any question about what you're bringing, whether it can come on the plane or not, um, that's the best number to call and find out. And uh, with that, we go to my last slide. So basically, my takeaway points are you have different disability laws that apply to airlines. And your rights under those are very limited. As we see, the Department of Transportation can't do much. Um, unfortunately, emergency landings aren't easy. However, there isn't a limitation to bringing food on board other than that three ounce rule, and you are allowed to bring medicine with you. So the best bet is for you to bring your medicine, to be prepared, and to realize that you're going to have to take a proactive approach to keeping safe on the airline. And with that, I'll turn it over. All right. Well, thank you. That was. Uh, can everybody hear me? Thank you. That was very, very informative. Um, I actually learned a lot in. Um
listening to some of the legal aspects that as a, as a researcher I'm not always sort of in tune to. I deal with a lot of the scientific aspects. Anyways, uh, so my name is Matt Greenhaut. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan and I am the research director for our new food allergy center. Next slide. I have a number of disclosures. Um, I, I do a lot in the advocacy world um, and I do a lot with education including work for the National Peanut Board. Um, and I'm an editor of a, of a journal. Um, next slide, please. Uh, but uh, Matt, some people can't hear you. Can you turn your volume up a little? I can. Is that any better? I'm sorry, some people can't hear you. Is that any um, better? I, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, it, but um, for those of you who do know me, uh, basically whenever I do a presentation or write anything, this is always reflecting sort of my own personal understanding of the available medical literature um, and not necessarily reflecting any opinion of people that I work with, work for, or who fund me. So with that, next slide. So the goals for today in this webinar, really my aims are to help you foremost be empowered to fly. and. If we can accomplish that, hopefully you won't fear the experience. I'd also like you to have some understanding and sort of learn the way that I understand what the true risk of flying with a food allergy really is. Learn some more reasons why peanut is probably unlikely to ever be removed from planes, at least under current legislation. And of the utmost importance, learn how you can best protect yourself or your child. Next slide. So we talk about the f rise in food allergy prevalence, but I, I would say that we really need to say it's the presumed rise. Um, in, in the past, we really haven't done a good job of measuring what food allergy rates were maybe back in the 80s or the 90s. We know what it is right now, but we really don't know what it was then. We all think it's rising. I wouldn't argue that it's rising, but I would say, do we have definitive proof of that? No. What we have a little bit more definitive proof is showing that peanut and tree nut allergy is also likely rising. There have been a couple of studies that have looked at waves of, of survey response over time and waves of medical records over time, including work at Mayo Clinic, uh, work by Dr. Sisher at Mount Sinai, um, and, and some other surveys that basically showed that there is an increase, at least in the report, in the, either through medical records or on a survey when you ask somebody, are you allergic to peanut, that that seems to be increasing, and, and a, a little bit alarmingly so over time. Um, we don't have a true rate of prevalence of peanut allergy in the United States. The only place where we really have an accurate rate is in Australia, where they, they skin tested and then challenged all one-year-olds within a certain geographic area. Um, and they were able to figure out with, with pretty good precision how many kids actually reacted. We don't have anything like that in time. So we, uh, we, we have a little bit more indirect methods of understanding um, how many people are affected by peanut allergy. But let's say for argument's sake, it's somewhere between 1% to 2%. That's if you translate that in a different way, that means 99 out of 100 people do not have peanut allergy, or 98 to 99 out of 100 do not have peanut allergy. However, peanut allergy seems to be a huge influence on public policy. There's a lot of pressure on public venues to maybe remove peanuts from certain um, aspects of, of, of the services they provide. So I'm talking about peanut-free ball games, maybe removing peanuts from schools, maybe removing peanuts from airplanes or other travel venues. There's a large call for legislative advocacy, and there's even sort of questions of how federal disability law may, um, may, may pertain to this. The real question that, that I always wonder is, do we really understand what the risk of, of a public exposure to something like peanut is, and how, how dangerous is it to somebody? Next slide. So some of the the questions that, that we get a lot as, as allergists are, are, they're very good questions and we often don't have a good answer to them and that, that's our fault and we need to work harder to get there. Um, but questions that we are always asked, is my child severely reactive? That's, that's very hard, that's very hard to say. Um, you know, we say that food allergy is progressively more reactive, the next exposure could be worse. We don't have definitive data that it necessarily is. We're just not interested in knowing what the next reaction is like. We'd rather you not have that exposure. Will my child react from smelling peanut butter? That's, that's one that we get all the time, especially in school settings. Will my child react from being near peanut dust? Will my child react from smelling a product that might contain peanut? Should my child be totally isolated from peanut or should that environment be totally peanut free? I mean, these are very, very important questions, things that, you know, I sense 
parents are very, very worried about and, and might actually cause a lot of stress in, in the life. Um, but these are not necessarily answers that, that we have or that we have good data to really give you what we think is the best answer or something that may not shift over time. Next question. What we do know is this, from looking at all the, and there aren't a lot of them, but the studies that, that have studied sort of how peanut may distribute in the environment, it appears that the risk of reaction from public exposure is quite low. We know from a, a couple of studies that we're going to go over that peanut dust and peanut butter don't aerosolize. We know that smelling peanut butter is actually quite safe. There's no protein in there, so therefore you can't actually have a, an Ig-mediated reaction. Um, we know that peanut residue is rather easily cleaned from most surfaces. We know that, at least compared to where we were 10, 15 years ago, the labeling on packaged goods has generally become much more clear. Now, it's not perfect. I'm not making any uh, claims that it is perfect. But in general, the companies get it right. There are some slip-ups every now and then. But in general, if something has peanuts in it, it is declared in plain language. And that's a big jump from where we were uh, back in the early 2000s. The one thing that the medical community keeps trying to uh, push forward is that the risk uh, of a reaction really comes from ingesting or eating the peanut, not necessarily from smelling or inhaling it. Uh, one of the more controversial pieces that um, uh, we've tried to look at is that peanut bans have no evidence that they work. I know this is something that a lot of people are, are advocates for, and you know, in theory it makes a lot of sense. but we, we don't have any evidence that in the circumstances where they've been enacted that they actually do their job. Actually, we have a study that we're trying to publish now that showed that up to 20% of reported reactions to peanut and tree nut occurred in what was at the time called a nut-free school. So, um, you know, it makes you think, how enforceable are these things? Do they really work? The other, um, and this is something we learned um, quite recently is that parent opinions on bans and restrictions are not necessarily unified. We did a study through the CSMOT Children's, uh, National Children's Health Poll, and we found that um, we saw a big consensus of opinions, not one major consensus, but a wide range on sort of how you would handle things in school. Do you want a ban? Do you want a ban in the classroom? Do you want a ban in the lunchroom? So it, it sort of it tells us that there's not one answer, and I think that that's important to consider going forward when you're talking about making a public policy. When you make a policy, it really is a one-size-fit-all thing. And you really should have a clear consensus of what everybody wants and who all the stakeholders are. Um, and one of the things that we learned recently is that even within the peanut allergy community, there is not necessarily unified consensus. So we, we really should be careful in the actions that we choose because it may not satisfy everybody's needs or desires. Next slide. So what I want to focus on for the next part of the webinar are four studies that demonstrate that there's little to no risk from the first one we'll go over casual skin contact with peanut butter, touching surfaces that might have had peanut on them that have been washed, inhaling shelled peanut or peanut butter vapors, and then cumulative effects of environmental dust in, in the home environment. Next slide. So the first study that I want to talk about is uh, an old one, but still a quite, quite good one, and one that's, that's very pertinent to today's environment. Is there a risk from smell or contact to peanut butter? Um, this is a question that was addressed about uh, 12 years ago now. Um, and the, the burning question was, what happens when somebody smells peanut butter, or what happens when peanut butter is applied to somebody's skin? So this is a study done in a small patient subset at Mount Mount Sinai. Um, these were all very severely reactive patients, all who had reports of either inhalation or contact reactions or both. And it was a very simple experiment. They were, they were blinded, meaning that they didn't know if they were smelling peanut or if they were smelling something else because they used a mask. Um, and uh, that, that vehicle was, was held beneath their nose and they were asked to inhale and then they were watched to see if there was a reaction. And in a separate experiment, they smeared a little bit of peanut butter, or um, actually the placebo vehicle there was soy butter, um, on the skin to see what would happen. Amazingly, they found that nobody reacted to either the inhalation of the vapors or skin contact. They did notice some irritation with skin contact. So um, three patients had a little local erythema, or erythema is the, 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 the $5 word for um, a little bit of redness. Five had some local itching, um, and but 
um, an equal number had uh, symptoms from the application of soy butter. So this study sort of showed that, A, if you wipe something on somebody's skin that's meant to go in their mouth, it's probably a little bit irritating. And they found that really um, butters in general seem to be a little bit irritating. But I think that the, the more important point here was that nobody reacted to the masked odor of peanut butter. Um, so they, what they did is they put either um, tuna or mint in, into, the, um, into the cup, so you didn't know what you were smelling, so you took away sort of the, the priming effect that you might know. Um, but the vapors were still there and nobody reacted. So they concluded that it's very, very unlikely that somebody would react from either contact or from inhalation. Next slide. So what about peanut dust and contaminated surfaces? So um, the group at Johns Hopkins about a year later did a follow-up study um, to, to this study. And their question was, what's the risk in like a, a school or a home setting from a little bit more targeted exposure? So what can clean peanut from tabletops, counters, desks, and water fountains? What can clean it from your hands? And what happens when we release dust up into the air? Can we, can we detect it? Um, so pretty innovative experiment. Um, and what they found was that on the tables, that dish soap does not remove peanut. But they found that water, um, a product called Formula 409, Lysol, and uh, Target brand cleaner with bleach did. Um, and when they looked at hand washing, um, more amazing, they found that soap and water were very good, but hand sanitizer, the gel hand sanitizer, didn't remove peanut. Um, so, you know, that's pretty important because I work in a hospital and over the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen sort of a de-emphasizing of washing hands with soap and water. Everybody wants us to use the hand sanitizer because studies have shown that we're just more likely to do it and that it kills certain types of viruses. And I know that, um, you know, you really can't move you know, more than a couple of yards in the United States without finding some sort of gel hand sanitizer product. However, that's really not adequate for removing allergen from the hands. So you got to be careful. Uh, good old fashioned soap and water or some wipe that has a, a, a detergent uh, agent on it. Those seem to be the more effective things. Uh, the last part of this experiment was the airborne one. So what they did is they, they literally dumped shells on the floor in a poorly ventilated room and had volunteers walk on them with filters at their neck trying to see if they could detect any allergen. And they were not able to find anything. They weren't able to find anything with the ventilation on or with the ventilation off. So from this, the investigators concluded that it looks like you know there are certain ways that peanut can be effectively removed, not only from your skin, but from surfaces and that dust does not seem to pose much of a risk because we couldn't detect it. And if you can't detect it up at the level of the mouth or the nose, then it would be pretty hard to have a reaction. So, um, you know, again, a little bit uh, of, a, of a different experiment than the first one, um, but again, you know, an equally important complement to that. Next slide. Um, so, those studies were done uh, 2002 and then 2004, and for the last uh, about nine years, that, that was basically all the evidence that we had about sort of environmental risk. And, you know, they're small studies, and they really hadn't been replicated um, un until a group from London um, wanted to look at household consumption and dust amounts. Um, they had published earlier in about 2008 that they thought that um, the rates of food allergy may be um, directly proportional to the amount of sort of non-oral exposure that you get in the house. And by non-oral exposure, we mean oils and creams and just sort of, you know, accumulated effects of, of other ways that you could be exposed to an allergen without eating it. Um, so they did a, a study of 45 homes where um, they asked them basically not to wash their sheets or vacuum for five days. It sounds like uh, my college dorm experience. Um, and then um, they went into these homes and they collected uh, dust with a specialized vacuum filter and then used a, a very sensitive probe and sort of did a surface wipe to see you know, what they could collect from those samples. And what they found was that peanut was found in several areas. Um, and interestingly enough, they found the highest level of accumulated dust in the child's play area. And they looked at not only the play areas, but also the different bed sides. So they looked at, at dad's side of the bed, mom's side of the bed, the baby's bed, the sibling's bed. Um, but they found that the highest concentration of peanut dust was found in the infant play area. 
And when they looked at all the areas that they wiped, they found that the most contaminated area was the dishwasher handle versus other surfaces in the house, tables, counters, et cetera, et cetera. And they consistently found when they looked across all the different samples that the dust uh, contents that they vacuumed up always sort of had more protein than what they wiped. So um, that means that sort of the surfaces maybe held less than sort of corners in your room or whatnot. Um, they found that when they looked at laminate or wood tables that were smeared with peanut butter and clean, that they found very, very minimal residual levels, 10 micrograms. That's a very, very tiny amount that only um, the most sensitive of sensitive probes is going to pick up. Um, they found that sofa dust uh, was reduced almost a thousandfold when they put those contaminated samples in the washing machine. Um, and the, uh, the one stat that I think that everybody's probably going to pay the most attention to is that they looked at distribution of dust in the environment. So they did an experiment where they had somebody actively um, deshell peanuts from uh, just a standard package. And they put a probe about uh, a half an inch right over somebody's hands while they were shelling and then add uh, about a yard over that, that area. So uh, one probe at the hand level while we're basically right in the field of where you're shelling and then one sort of a, a foot or two above their head. And they found that there was a detectable level of peanut dust noted right at one centimeter, so basically right in the field, but it was only 331 micrograms. And at a meter above somebody's head, it was 4.7 micrograms. And instantly, as soon as they stopped shelling, they found that the levels were absolutely undetectable. So, um, you know, people talk about, you know, maybe the, the study that the Johns Hopkins group did, how, how valid was it? Was it, you know, they were, they were, they were crushing shells. What happens at the table level? What happens if it's really close? Um, this group basically showed that the level trails off quite distinctly and is only present during active shelling. Um, this group went further and took some of these residual dust levels and tried uh, a lab experiment where they tried to activate an allergic cell called a basophil. Um, and they found that there was a varying effect, that they needed very, very high lab concentrations to make those basophils turn on. Um, but they weren't able to attach any what we call clinical significance to it. Um, so what that means is that in the lab, you can put enough into the, um, into the dish that you're working with to make these cells turn on but there's no way that that sort of translates to doing any harm to your body. It's just a pure lab effect. Um, and what they concluded was that these levels that they found might be enough to maybe sensitize somebody, meaning give them a, a positive skin test or a blood test, but are highly, highly unlikely to cause a reaction. Next slide. Um, but they were very careful to specify that when they looked at this, this is a cumulative effect of not cleaning your house after several days. And of course, dust will accumulate. Um, and they also were very, very careful to say that the probe that they used was designed to really capture anything that was there. Um, and again, when you're using something that's very, very sensitive, meant to capture anything that's there, sometimes it might be a little... Uh, misleading to necessarily jump to a conclusion that that, that means something that there's going to be a harmful effect on your body. Um, you know, these, these, these levels were very, very low. Um, the airborne level for peanut was a hundredfold less um, when you went up about three feet. It was detectable. I wouldn't argue that it's detectable, but it's 4.76 micrograms. That, that really is not anything significant. It, it's very hard to quantify. You need a very specialized scale to even weigh that out. There are so many zeros that go um, before the 4.76. Um, but again, that was only when they stuck a probe, like literally right in the field of where somebody was shelling peanut. Um, and based on that, again, they, they concluded that, yes, there might be a little bit of dust, but it goes up very, very briefly and then settles on the counter. Um, and they were very, very careful to say that, you know, these are detectable levels, but they're very, very low. And that brought into question this sort of concept of what is the threshold of exposure that somebody would need to provoke a reaction. Now, that is a loaded question well beyond sort of the scope of this webinar. Um, it's sort of a, a hot question that a lot within the field are looking at, um, but the levels that were detected appear to be well below any level that would provoke human disease. Um, 
I, I'm not sure that I'm going to reassure everybody listening to that by saying it, but uh, I'm going to show you some data in a couple of slides that maybe will help sort of reassure that at least when they've studied this, that this is almost a thousandfold lower um, than a, a dose that would even be needed to, to provoke a reaction in the most reactive of the most reactive patients that we know. Um, so again, washing. I think the take home point here is that there are things that you can do. You can wash your surfaces with certain products and you reduce the level of exposure significantly, uh, which I think is good. So this is now the third study that sort of showed there is something that can be done and it's something that you can do and these, these tools are available to you. you. Everybody has a vacuum, everybody has certain or at least the ability to buy certain types of wipes. Um, these are things that you can do to help reduce your exposure. Next slide. So this is highly technical data, and I apologize for a very, very small graph and small prints, but um, this is data from a recently published study out of uh, Europe where they looked at how much peanut, or and you can see there are a couple of allergens up there, how much peanut would it take to provoke a reaction in somebody? And I want you to concentrate on the two boxes. Um, and that, these boxes basically say that you would need 0.15 milligrams to provoke a reaction in the most reactive 1% of everybody that was tested, and 1.56 milligrams to provoke a reaction in the most 5% uh, reactive. Now, to give you some perspective, 0.15 milligrams is equivalent to 150 micrograms. Um, these are, again, a, a very, very, very small amounts and that's you're dealing with the most reactive of the most reactive subset. So when you look at an amount at three feet above somebody's head that's under five micrograms, that really is reassuring to me as an investigator saying, well boy, even in the in the in the most reactive case, that's still well above a, 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 a you know, that's almost a hundred times above uh below a level that I think would actually provoke a reaction. And when you move up to how many would, would you know, if you took 100 kids um, and, and looked at only the 5% the that were most reactive, then you're moving up even another power of 10. So um, these levels, again, you know, there's something that's detectable. And again, if you have a, an instrument that's, that's good enough to really capture anything that's there, you're going to find something. But the point of this slide is to tell you that it probably does not translate to any danger. Again, I'm showing you data that, that you know, is controversial, but I, I want you to understand sort of the way that I look at it and some other providers look at it that, you know, you know there might be small amounts out there, but it's probably, you know, below a level that would ever do any harm. And I, I want to present that as something that could be potentially empowering and reassuring. Um, I don't know if it will be. Um, I'm looking forward to some feedback on that. But again, this is, this is the best data that we have. This is all that's out there. Um, I will say that this, uh, this, this ED5 or the 5% level of reactivity was recently reconfirmed in another trial that's in press in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology right now. Um, just under 2 milligrams was, was the level that, that caused 5% uh, of the patients to react. So again, you know, I think we're narrowing in that there is a, a magic number that most people are okay at. Um, once you go above there, you might start to see some troubles, but these levels are much, much higher than anything that you'd expect to sort of errantly or haphazardly see in the environment. Next slide. So let's talk about specific airline reactions. You'll, you'll see that I, I spent a lot of time talking about ground-based studies, and, um, and, and that, that's, that's for a specific reason. As, as Laurel explained, um, you know, there, there's no precedent to go up in the air and, and actually get any of these data. It's a very um, powerfully written appropriations act that, that's prevented that for a number of years now. So um, we have to do with what we have, which is ground-based data, but I'm going to hopefully build a case that shows how some of that can apply to how you can reduce your risk. So let's look at airline reaction. So uh, about six years now, um, we tracked 150 self-reported reactions uh, through what was the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network at the time. Um, we noticed that there was a high level of repeat uh, reactions, almost 42% had had a higher reaction, uh, a prior reaction. We noticed that 15.7% reported that they had ingested and had a reaction, and almost 50% reported that they'd inhaled and gotten a reaction, um, which was a little bit alarming, but it goes 
um, it, it goes with earlier data by Scott Sisher, who did a 1999, really a, a very landmark study, something that actually got me inspired to become an allergist and study this, where he hypothesized that a, a number of the airborne reactions that they tracked at that time came right as sort of more peanuts were uh, distributed into the cabin. So we've been aware of these reports of inhalation reactions for a long, long time. Um, I want to de-emphasize the route of reaction and go to sort of what's happening when we are getting these reaction reports. In this study, um, we noted that almost a third of the reported symptoms would be consistent with criteria that we would say um, equate to anaphylaxis. However, only 10% of the reactions that we tracked in, in, in that study uh, were reportedly treated with epinephrine. Now, that, that, you don't need to be a math wizard to understand that if you have a third of your reactions being consistent with anaphylaxis, and only one out of ten of those reactions is being treated with epinephrine, that that's potentially dangerous. Um, and we were quite alarmed to see that. Other things that we found out in this very early study, um, only 52% of people who reacted reported making a change in their flying behavior. The most alarming of that was that 12% stopped flying, which we found we understood. You know, certainly we can empathize with that, but it was, it was something that we saw as um, room for improvement. Is there anything that we can do to you know, make life easier for, for such families? Um, and you know the, the take home of this study was that there were a high percentage of severe reactions not treated with epinephrine, and that was really sort of an eye-opening uh, statement to us, and, and that had not been tracked previously. Next, next slide. Sorry, I think. Um, and in, in looking at that study, um, that was a study that I did while I was still a, a fellow in training. Um, at, at Michigan, and I didn't know a lot about research. And one of the mistakes I made was that I completely wrote off people who fly but don't have reactions. You know, um, as Laurel had had pointed out, there are a lot of what we call enplanements, meaning physically getting on a plane um, each year, and there's a very very low rate of reported reactions. Um, and we are we have focused on those who report reactions, um, but there's another side to that coin. In, in those who fly safely, and, and um, you know, while, while there are reported reactions and reactions continue to be reported, there are 10 to 20 fold more reports of safe flying that happens every day. Um, and when we wanted to look at sort of what, what maybe makes people stand out who can fly safely versus those who have reacted, um, we realized that we had really missed the ball and, and a lot of data in our earlier studies and sort of not paying attention to what makes those people um, fly safely. So um, while we had reports of over 400 persons in three studies, um, we had issues to address with, with sort of uh, airline reactions. Um, we still were dealing with really no proof that airborne reactions could happen. There are multiple legal issues that were preventing us from studying this. Um, our earlier study had showed that there's a high rate of severe reactions potentially, um, and, and that epinephrine seems to be underutilized as a treatment. The question that we had is that what sets people apart um, who fly safely from those who have flown and had a reaction? Was there anything that those people did that maybe influenced their chance of reacting? Um, and again, that was sort of a mea culpa saying, boy, we missed the ball, and we had sort of left out this very important segment in our earlier study. So our goal was to look at it not only in the United States, but also to look at it across the world, because the United States is not the only, only uh, country that's dealing with peanut allergy and peanut allergy in flight. Um, so we looked at over 3,000 respondents from 11 countries in a large, large study that some of you might have participated in that was coordinated through the International Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Alliance. Next slide. Sorry, uh, next slide, please. So, and this is a dense slide, and I apologize, but um, what I want you to look at is is the difference in the columns. Um, what we did is we looked at a number of different accommodations and behaviors that we've heard. And, and uh, uh, two people were very instrumental in helping me compile some of these things. The first was the former CEO of FAN, was Terry Furlong, and then the VP of Advocacy, Chris Weiss, who literally had notebooks full of complaints that they used to field about sort of 
what happened to people on the airplane, and then people would call in and say, you know, this worked for me, maybe this can help somebody else. So um, we compiled a lot of that data and asked some questions about things that maybe you did or didn't do. We were able to sort of split it up into the percent who did each behavior, who reported a reaction and didn't report a reaction. And you can see just scanning down the columns that there are differences in, in some of these behaviors between people who didn't report a reaction versus those who did. And this sort of clued us in that maybe there were things that, that, that passengers could do that might help them out. Um, next slide. This is just looking at the characteristics of the reactors. And you can see, again, a very dense slide meant for a journal article. But I, I wanted to share with you all the available tools I had, uh, no matter how dense and maybe uh, sleep-inducing it might be to go through some of these things. Um, so we're looking at the times of reaction. Again, you can see sort of a nice distribution of patients who've reacted recently versus those who reacted a, a while ago. The majority of the reactions that we track, again, are mainly to peanut. You can see almost 70% there. Um, and again, a high reported um, route of reaction saying that I, I inhaled it. Um, and again, almost the same amount of individuals who had had a, a, a prior reaction. So there are a lot of sort of repeat reactions that happen, which is concerning to us because we, we need to do something to help protect some of these people. Um, again, we saw very disturbing trends with epinephrine use. Again, only 13.3% of almost 350 reactors um, received epinephrine for the reaction. Um, the one thing we did see uh, was that almost two-thirds made some sort of accommodation or asked for something, did some sort of behavior, which was, which was reassuring. Um, the one thing that we saw was that um, if you look at the, the third column over where it says the percent less than 12Y, so that's the percentage uh, that this happened in, in basically children versus teenagers versus adults is the way that we looked at it. Um, the, the, the biggest risk tends to be food allergic adults traveling. Um, but um, you know, that, 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 that's something that we need to look out for going forward. But um, again, you can see sort of a nice distribution across age. But um, you know, in, in terms of did we learn anything when we repeated this survey a couple of years later? No, we're still seeing a lot of inhalation reactions. We're still seeing most of the reactions to peanut. Um, we're still seeing a lot of repeat reactions that are being reported. And we're still seeing very few people using epinephrine, which is disturbing to see that only moved by about 3%. Um, next slide. Um, so, this is where we really started to zero in on um, what was important. So these, these behaviors, so things that we thought might be important. So requesting that a peanut or tree nut snack not be distributed. Having the, uh, the crew make an announcement to please not eat anything containing peanut or tree nut. Um, for the passenger to request a special meal for themselves, to request a buffer zone, to request a pre-board to request to sit in certain zones, you know, maybe at the back of the plane, the front of the plane, the side of the plane. Um, I do this when I fly for superstitious reasons, but um, you know, this is something that we had heard. Um, and then behaviors that <coughs> that passengers reported doing. So bringing your own food on board, wiping down your tray table, wiping down your armrest, not using a pillow or blanket that the airline provides, wiping your seatbelt, wiping your your seat back, and then wiping surfaces like bathroom door handles. And this was years before the, the, the data on the MRSA and all the other probably lovely bacteria that are bred on airplane came out. Uh, I would personally advocate that you should wipe everything in, 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 in your immediate reach when you get on an airplane for infectious reasons. But um, I'm going to present some data that shows that, that it's actually good for an allergy reducing um, standpoint as well. Um, so you can look across these columns and you can see that there are much higher percentages of these reported behaviors um, for patients uh, who didn't report reacting versus those who did. And, and that really clued us in where to sort of look in a higher level analysis. So next slide. So what we did is a, an advanced statistical technique called a regression. It's, it's, it's really not important, but it's it's a tool that allows us to feed a bunch of uh, variables into an equation, and basically it allows you to make a prediction. Um, does this increase your chances or decrease your chances? So we wanted to know if 
if these behaviors that we fed into this model were associated with increasing your odds of reporting a reaction or decreasing your odds of reporting a reaction. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that this wasn't affected by how old somebody was, what their nationality was, what their gender was, what their particular allergen was, if they'd had a prior reaction, or if they were a self-reported case or this is somebody who had seen an allergist and had what we would in, in the allergy world call proper evaluation. Um, and again, these are all behaviors that I showed you on the, on the last slide, and these are all things that we have been hearing about as potentially helping. So we, we wanted to see was there definitive proof of this. And what we found were that eight behaviors seem to lower your odds of reacting quite significantly. And those were making any request of the airline. So anything on that last slide, doing any of those actions overall lowered your odds of reacting. But the specific ones, so making a request for a buffer zone making a request for an announcement not to eat peanut or tree nut items on board, requesting for yourself or for your child a peanut-free meal, wiping down your tray table, bringing your own food, and avoiding use of the airline blankets or pillows. Things that didn't show any statistical association, pre-boarding, sitting in a particular area of the cabin, um, having the airline not distribute peanut or tree nut containing snacks, and then sort of wiping these other areas, common surfaces, your armrests, your, your, your seat back, or your seat belt. Um, it was very interesting. The data that I'm not showing you is that um, one of the fascinating things was how this sort of played out, that in different countries, the passengers who reported or didn't report a reaction, that the, some of the things that they did sort of varied depending on where you were. The Canadians were more likely to do certain things and less likely to do some things than were patients from Japan or patients from Europe or patients from Australia. And that, that was really fascinating to sort of see the, the way that this culturally has adapted. But what this showed was that just the, the act of, 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 of either making some of these requests or doing some of these actions was associated with a much lower chance of that passenger reporting a reaction. So we consider these to be what we would say risk-reducing behaviors. Now, I will preface this by saying that this is all based on the passenger's report. We weren't there. We didn't verify that they actually did any of these things, um, but I'm inclined to believe that they did. Um, I certainly can't attest that when a buffer zone was requested that it was actually given to that patient or anything like that. But again, just these sort of awareness issues um, were associated with lower odds of reaction. So next slide. So the implications for all of this. So um, based on the available medical evidence, and I know that some people may not agree, they may not think that some of those studies that I talked about were good or relevant to their situation, and you know that, that's probably true in some situations, maybe not so true in others, I, I don't know. I mean, I, again, it's limited evidence, but the evidence that we have, the cards that we uh, are able to play, seem to suggest that the, the risk of reacting on an airplane or in any other public venue from, uh, from exposure to peanut is quite low outside of somebody ingesting it. Um, right now, our, our burden and, and, and the, the, the Appropriations Act, um, really, it literally says that for us to free up federal money, we need to do a study that not only shows that peanut circulates in a particular environment, but that those levels do harm. So those who maybe don't agree with this whole threshold phenomenon, it's a very important burden for us to show. We, we need to know how reactive somebody is because that's a cornerstone of being able to free up money to do these studies. Now, I don't agree with this public law. I think it was sort of very cleverly written to prove a point, but it, it is what it is, and we, we, we have to, you know, we have to be able to to do these studies, so that means that we have to sort of make a decision that it would be ethical to put a patient through an exposure challenge just to free up money, and, and um, I know a lot of providers have, have some problems with that. I, I go back and forth whether or not that would be ethical or not, um, and, and even if I thought it was ethical, um, boy, I, I don't know too many parents who would subject their child to an, an inhalational challenge just, you know, for research purposes, uh, you know, so, um, there are definite uh, uphill obstacles to face in sort of getting some funding and getting the ability to study this on an airplane, um, which was really sort of a thing that I realized when I designed the study looking at, you know, what are things that we could 
to do in the meanwhile until this law changes or somebody comes up with this proof are the things that passengers can do themselves to be empowered to take the action into their own hands. Um, and, and maybe, you know, if, if we show that certain things work, this just sort of eliminates the whole sort of stress of the conversation between the allergy community, the medical community, and the airlines about sort of what's the right policy and, you know, to eliminate sort of uh, eliminate an argument that doesn't need to happen. We can show that certain things work, and I don't think that anybody on the, on the airline side is going to argue that these strategies work. And these are very easy. These are things that you don't need the airline's permission to do. You can you can ask. You may not get it, as Laurel explained, but you can certainly ask. And nobody's stopping you from bringing a wipe. Um, I will say this: with looking at all the data about the the dust settling and everything like that, if you open your tray table and you open a package of peanut and you eat over that the dust is going to settle right on that tray table. And I think that a lot of people sort of focus on the smell and the aroma. They don't realize that their hands could be touching a surface that's contaminated. Now, I don't, I'm not aware consciously of how many times my hands may go to my mouth during a given day, but I'm going to assume that it's a lot. Um, certainly, I watch my children. Their hands are always in their mouth. So, uh, you know, it's, it's easy for me to imagine sort of, you know, not necessarily breathing something in, but you're touching a surface that you're not, uh, in tune might be contaminated. That hand goes to the mouth. You've just ingested something. And I think that that's probably where most of the airline reactions are coming from. Um, again, I'm, I'm not here to argue that you can or can't inhale it. I'm here to just say it's a little bit more likely to sort of draw this path that um, certainly some people are touching a surface that they're not aware is contaminated. So please, if you're going to do anything and take anything away from this webinar, please wipe down those surfaces. That I think is very, very important. Um, you know, in terms of looking at the ways that we can interact with the airline industry, what are we going to do? Um, I mean, this can be considered a very antagonistic conversation. Um, you know, I, I think that overall, um, you know, there are people who have horrible, horrible experiences flying. They're not treated well by the airline. Sometimes, though, those people maybe don't treat the airline so well as well. Again, we're not here to levy blame or anything like that. There's always two sides to the conversations. What we do tend to hear about are these high publicity cases where it's really hard to tell what might have happened, what provoked the situation, what really was or wasn't done. So I'd say take the media reports with a grain of salt, but take the scientific evidence seriously. Um, there are things that you can do. There are definite things that you can do to help reduce your risk. Um, but in the end, when it comes down to where, how is a policy going to be written, what are your rights going to be, knowing that disability laws sort of have maybe not so much applicability in the air, as physicians and as the government, they're going to have to draw a line between making somebody more comfortable potentially by removing peanut from a flight where you think, well, if there's no peanut on the flight, then it's really going to reduce the chance of exposure. I won't argue that. But what I'm saying is that there may not be a true medical need to do that. And I think sometimes that's very hard. And I, I apologize if I'm coming off as insensitive in saying that, but the way that policy is looked at and the way that in the medical community we look at this, you know, it's a very simple question. Could you know, will this cause harm? And if it doesn't, then we're sort of obligated to say that. So again, until somebody comes up with a study that shows, you know, what the harm is, it's it's a gray area. It's very, very murky. It makes all of us dealing with this very, very uncomfortable. Um, this, this isn't easy to get up here and talk about something that I, I perceive, you know, some of this data might not be well received by people in the audience. They may not agree with it. I, you know, um, I, you know, it is what it is. I don't, necessarily agree with everything that's that's been done the way that airline reactions have been handled I mean there's you know a, a lot that could be handled better we could have better data it's, it's an imperfect situation we're just trying to make the best of it now you know hopefully this will get better going forward next slide so Again, what I, what I really want you to take home from this is that there are factors that you as passengers can do to manipulate your odds. It's like uh, counting cards in Vegas or something like that. You can gain an advantage on the house. There are eight low-cost or no-cost strategies that you can do um, with little to no hassle or involvement from the airline. What I hope uh, is that you know maybe some of you who, who don't like to fly or are uncomfortable to fly or just outright don't fly, Maybe you're willing to try one of these and see, could this change things? You can take that vacation that you've always wanted to, that the kids are begging you to take. You know, hopefully it'll reduce your anxiety. Um, maybe over time, a repeated experience will reduce your anxiety if you, you know, become comfortable with 
of these things. Um, but really, you know, what I what I wanted to do was just show that there are some future policy points here, some future study outcomes that we can look at. Um, but understand that sort of the big, the home run here, removing peanuts from the airplane is probably unnecessary looking at all the evidence that we have now and just probably unlikely to happen and, and that it, we can't view this as sort of what we call a zero-sum game. That means that if I win by by definition you have to lose. It's sort of, you know, there might be a win-win situation here where you can be protected, other passengers aren't disturbed, and the airline gets what they want out of it. And that's sort of, that's where policy discussions go. They really try to maximize the amount of people who sort of get something out of it. Um, it's not going to be all one-sided. We need to focus on reaction treatment, not necessarily the bans. Again, you know, banning peanut, you know, there are arguments for it, there are arguments against it, but please notify the crew when there's a reaction that's happening and travel with epinephrine. And if you're having symptoms that, you know, your action plan advises you, you know, if you're having respiratory symptoms or two, two organ system symptoms, your action plan on the ground would tell you to, you know, go ahead and give epinephrine there. I mean, you, you have to follow your action plan. A lot of reactions just aren't treated, I think, to the level that they need to be. Um, so that, that's, that's important. And again, hopefully through this, you know, at least I've broadened your awareness that there is sort of a, another level to looking at what the risk is, that there are some, you know, there are some misconceptions out there about what might happen, what's likely to happen, or even what might be needed. Um, you know, and and that the the airlines may seem insensitive, but you know, there's a they're not obligated to do a lot. And I I think sort of understanding what you're likely to get out of the experience before you step onto the plane may reduce some stress and some confrontation in the front. Now, again, I don't make any claims that in in some of these situations that you hear about that the airline handled themselves right. There's always a way to strive and improve your customer service, but um, again, you know. There are definite things that you are entitled to and probably more things than you realize that you're not. So just sort of arm yourself with the information. Um, and also understand that not everybody in the peanut allergic community may necessarily agree that peanuts have to be banned from airplanes. You're going to see a wide range of opinion. Um, and also don't assume that people who don't have peanut allergy um, are like demanding to have their peanuts. Um, anecdotally, I have uh, agreed to sort of look at, at risk with them um, is to sort of understand that if there's a danger that everybody wants what's in the best interest for the passenger. Nobody's out to get anybody. And I, I think that sometimes that that's hard to, to place into perspective. Um, next slide. So again, the final steps. Again, these are the eight actions we talked about. Um, I really like for people to take away from this that you are empowered to at least consider that there are steps that you may be able to take yourself that could help um, and, and maybe that makes you a, a little less anxious about flying and a little bit more likely to, you know, to, to, to move towards buying that ticket or taking that trip. I, you know, I think that it's important to live a full life even though you might have a child with food allergy and if there's anything that we can do in terms of helping to define risk and everything like that, we, we want to do it. That's important to us. Next slide. Uh, Melanie, ne next slide. Oh, okay, so we're we're finally at the end of this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm just so impressed with what both of you shared with us. It was so informative, and I thank you both so much for your time. Um, we do have questions that have been submitted. I'm going to start before we answer this one with a couple of clarifications that some folks had asked for that I'd like for you to answer, Matt. Um, one of them was a mom who. Um, was looking at one of your slides and was concerned that one of them said that you can't have reactions from trace ingredients and I think it was the allergen threshold slide. Can you talk about that a little more? Sure. Um, what, that, what that slide shows was when they, they took a sample of patients um, and they wanted to know what is the minimal amount that it might take some of these patients to have a reaction. So, you know, if we give them very, very small increments of food, you know, is there a level below which that they're just 
not going to react, and at, and at what level does a reaction become apparent? So um, they, they, they look at this at, at two ways. They can look at sort of the percentage within the group that they study, and then they can try to broaden that to be representative of the population at whole. So um, in their estimation, based on um, the, the people that they got into that study, um, they found that the level that it took um, to cause sort of one out of 100 patients to react was 0.15 milligrams, um, but that it took almost 1.5 milligrams to make the next five people react. Um, and what that showed was that, you know, this is a concept that there, there might be sort of a critical line that needs to be crossed in terms of dosing um, to provoke a reaction. Now this is, this is a tangential subject here. Um, it's not that trace exposure can't cause a reaction. It certainly can, and I, you know, I, I've, I've, seen, I've seen that happen. What it's saying is that there probably is a level below which most of the population is safe at. Whether or not we can find that and whether or not we can get everybody to agree upon that level is another issue, but there probably is a magic line, a threshold that that exists. And how I see that being applied um, would be to sort of understand that maybe 4.76 micrograms that's up in the air at the level of somebody's nose probably isn't enough to trigger a reaction in, in uh, all but the most severely reactive of the severely reactive patients. Or what it might mean is that when you see something that may contain or might contain peanut and the company says this contains less than 10 parts per million, that it could be translated to say, well, 10 parts per million is, is far less than sort of what I know that my son or my daughter or my threshold is, so I probably am okay eating this. And, and that's sort of the direction um, at least some in the um, food allergy research community are going. So I, I put that up there as a way to sort of help translate what 300 micrograms or 10 micrograms or, or 4.76 micrograms may be, not to confuse anybody, not to refute that trace reactions can't happen. They, they, they absolutely can. It's, it's just sort of, it, it's the next jump in where we're going and trying to sort of define where can we draw a line and say these people are really, really at high risk because they're significantly more sensitive to reactions than other people. And I think that's wonderful. I think that, um, I do think that if we can do this right, it will improve people's quality of life. It will give them back things that they haven't been able to have. And I, I see that as, as such a positive and something that we should be investigating. So um, that's all I'll say on that. Okay. Um, and then there was one other, I, I know that you talked about it, but I think it's important to talk about again. Someone was asking about inhalation reactions and touching the allergen and putting it in their mouth and whether that was an inhalation reaction or whatever. Can you clarify about sure. putting it in your mouth? Right. So when I talk about inhalation, that would be purely just breathing it in. It, you know, you take a deep breath, you inhale, you know, like a dust particle or something like that, as opposed to ingestion where you physically have put it into your mouth onto your mucous membranes um, with accumulated dose. Um, it, it may be a nitpicky definition, um, but I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm talking about like, you know, sort of dust that's circulating in the air and breathing that in and reacting from that as opposed to sort of touching a surface and then licking your fingers or something like that as being an ingestion. Uh, is that, okay. Do you think that that's clear? Yeah, and then um, just clarify for me, um, someone asked, did you say that water would remove peanut from surfaces? I'm sorry, soap, and I, if you go back to that slide, I think... Certainly Formula 409 and some of those industrial cleaners did. I think soap and water does not, I believe. Soap and water removes it from hands, but um, it didn't remove it from uh, countertops. If I misspoke on that, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, we're also going to send a link in the follow-up email that has um, Dr. Wood's study regarding that, so everybody can read it for themselves. So, okay, um, since we're running so late, I'm going to go ahead and skip the Q&A. Dr. Greenhot and um, Laurel have agreed to do a blog post to answer some of these questions as a follow-up, so we'll work with them about getting that published soon. Um, and what I want to do before we leave is announce the winners of the, of the six items. So um, the Sun Butter winners are Sean Taylor and Claire Williams. The Dr. Lucy winner is Elizabeth Grinzel and Katie Copenhagen. 
and um, let's see, and we had um, Allergic Traveler. The last two winners are Sue Schultz and Lindsay Roberts. So I want to thank you so much for staying with us. Most of you did hang here for the whole hour and a half, and I really appreciate your um, remaining until the end. We will be contacting those of you who won to get your contact information verified so we can send that stuff off to you. The archive of this webinar will be available in a few days, and we will send out a follow-up email with a link to that and a resource page with links to some of the studies and some other things that you can kind of um, have that resource information for your own personal use. Um, and then lastly, I want to tell you that our next webinar is coming up rather quickly. We're going to do it early in July. It's going to be back to school with food allergies and asthma with Dr. Mike Pissner and Dr. Dave Stukas, and it should be a really informative and fun webinar, and they're going to be accepting questions from you in advance so that they can kind of tailor it to what everyone's um, interests are for that particular session. We will be sending out a registration link for that webinar soon. So to wrap up, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Dr. Greenhot and to Laurel for joining us on this really informative webinar. Um, and then to let you know that Kids with Food Allergies is a charity, and we rely on donors um, like you to support our mission. So if you got some value out of this webinar, keep us in your charitable giving plans. Thank you so much for being here with us today, and um, I'll see you in a couple weeks at our next webinar. Bye.